In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most loving and affectionate Father, we continue contemplating the sins of mankind, our own sins. We realize that truly we are sinners and that we need your forgiveness. But we also need to understand what it means to be forgiven and to forgive others. Grant us a merciful heart, a heart for the miserable that we may imitate your only begotten Son, especially in his merciful love. We ask this through the intercession of the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of Mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, we contemplate or we think about the fall of the angels, the sin of one parent, one, one sin, the fall of Adam and Eve, in other words, and a soul in hell for one capital sin. How did that person arrive there? All this is to show how evil sin is. We need to understand the evil of sin in order to avoid it. Because if we don't, and that's the thing, we, we begin to, society wants us to kind of look and say, oh, well, that's not that bad. I'm not really hurting anybody else. Oh, well, this is okay in certain circumstances. But you see, according to the law of God, we cannot enter into that mental gymnastics. We need to know the seriousness of sin and the evil of sin. Now, everything that we do during the meditations are applying the memory, what God tells me or told me, the intellect, what does it mean to me practically, the will, my applied to God, my reaction to it, pouring out in prayer, the being lifted up by the light. Now, St. Paul implies that all the evil in the world is due to the devil. Highly superior beings that make sure that if possible, all goes wrong. The worst thing you can possibly do in the spiritual life or in your Christian life is to blame God. God is the only person in your entire life who has never nor could ever nor would ever hurt you. All evil, tsunamis, earthquakes, sinkholes, cancer, AIDS, um, everything, uh, every, any possible evil came into the world through sin. It is not God who sends tsunamis to punish us. We do. The difference is this, that God will help us, but we must reach out. When Peter was sinking in the water, it was a storm, and he was being buffeted. Jesus did not grab him by the scruff of the neck. He held out his hand. Peter had to raise his hand up and grab the hand of the Lord. So we, in the same way, we realize that the evils around us, the turmoil that we experience, is not from God. He's the one holding out his hand. He's the only one who has never hurt us. And so if you want to get mad, angry, get angry at the devil. Tell the damn fool to go to hell. It's the only time you can say that, you know. You can't tell anybody to go to hell, but the devil, that's where he lives. Just send him home. Now, Looking at our meditations, where is my book? Ah, can't find it. My book left. Oh, here it is. I got it. Now, looking at the meditation itself, in number 45, at the meditations, or at least this is for contemplation, it's not necessarily the meditation that you'll do this afternoon. In 45, which is what they consider the first exercise, and the reason why I'm going through this is because it's extraordinarily important to have these things at least in your mind when you're going over the meditations that you're dealing with. This is important. You don't have to use them as meditations. In the future, if you're going over your notes, this can be an entire meditation. But I'm going to take you through them so that you have it under your belt. That's why I say I'm giving you all of the notes of the 30-day retreat so that you don't miss out on anything that we're doing, so that you have in the back of your head, because that's the most important. Now, it says the first exercise is a meditation on the first, second, and third sin, employing the three powers of the soul. After the preparatory prayer and two preludes, it contains three principal points. Now, here they are. 
The preparatory prayer, I'll beg God our Lord for the grace that all my intentions, actions, operations may be directed purely to the praise and service of his divine majesty. The first prelude, a mental representation of the place. Attention must be called to the following point. When the contemplation or meditation is on something visible, for example, when we contemplate Christ our Lord, the representation will consist in seeing the imagination, the material place, where the object is that we wish to contemplate. I said the material place, for example, the temple or the mountain where Jesus, his mother is, according to the subject matter of the contemplation. In a case where the subject matter is not visible, as here, a disease and meditations on sin, for example, we're going to be looking at that now, um, the representation will see, be in the imagination of my soul and seeing myself as a prisoner in this corruptible body and to consider my whole composite being as an exile here on earth, cast out to live among brute beasts. He says, my whole composite being, body and soul. The second prelude, I will ask God our Lord for what I want and desire. The petition is made the prelude according to the subject matter. Okay. Now, we look at the, the principle of the meditation is in number 46. 47, we always have this, imagination. Use, if you can't have something physical, tangible, imagine yourself, your soul is a prisoner in your corruptible body, and you are in exile. We are pilgrims heading toward home. All what I want and desire is the utmost importance. Look what God has done for me. So many in hell, and I'm here, loved. It's kind of confusing, really, when you think of it. I don't know what to say. Yet I want it to really hit me. I want to be illuminated by grace. We must compose ourselves in order to meditate. Don't forget that. Compose yourselves. You've got to pull away from everything, then compose yourself in order to meditate every single time. Now we, we look at the sin of the angels in number 50. Using the memory, call the first sin, which was that of the angels, and then in applying the understanding by reasoning upon this sin, and you remember we talked about that earlier, about how, what, the, what was that sin? Was it just rejecting God? But it was rejecting the worship of Mary. I will put enmity between you and the woman. It's because of the woman. Now we look at 51, number 51. We apply these things to Adam and Eve. Don't worry about the myths people speak about, all the stupidity. Remember we talked about that in a time in eternity. We just... Look at the story. Look at the meaning, the purpose of this. The devil fell to envy, to pride. He would not bow to a creature lesser than himself. God skipped the angelic nature. Imagine. The angels thought, at least the third of the angels, thought that they were everything and that they would look down upon these creatures because they're lesser so God skipped the angelic nature and took up the human nature. And of course, Satan would say, why not use one of us? Why don't you become an angel? You can redeem them. Why become a creature? A person can be in hell for one capital sin. That's number 52. One sin. A sin has sent one person to hell. There's a big difference between mortal sin and venial sin. Mortal sin destroys the life of grace within us, and venial sin erodes that grace. A capital sin is one that you follow all the way through. There comes a time that one is so hardened that God sees that more grace would be rejected rather than send one deeper in hell. He no longer gives the grace anymore. And you can look at this. God is constantly giving us help. No question about it. Here's the person. This is the person. And they sin. Well, God gives them the grace not to sin. And they sin anyway. They have the grace not to. Every single person experiences this. God sends another grace. They sin anyway. He sends another one. They sin again. Another one. They sin again. Another one. And this goes on and on until there comes a point when God sees that this person will no longer embrace or does not embrace his grace, so he stops giving the grace. And we can see this in Pilate. Pilate and Jesus had some very good interaction. Pilate was asking questions. Jesus was answering. 
But there came a time after Pilate sent Jesus to Herod. Jesus never says another word. For every single word after, Pi after Herod would have been another grace rejected. So Jesus remained silent. The silence of Jesus speaks volumes. That is one capital sin. It is they go to hell for this sin. That's what Ignatius sees as the one capital sin. They go to hell for that one sin. If they didn't commit that sin, they would not be in hell. Satan must be real to me. It's not some game we play. Is not any mental gymnastics. He is always working with the retreatants during a retreat, when you're praying at home, when you're at mass, when you're dealing with your family and friends, relatives. Whether he's trying to distract you, call upon your angel. God has given you a person greater than you can ever imagine to run interference for you, to help you. Call upon your angel. Sprinkle holy water around you. Grab your miraculous medal. Hold your rosary. Make the sign of the cross. We are dealing with a person who is responsible for communism, for ISIS, for all of the evils in the world. This is the person we're dealing with. Just as you and I are persons, so are the demons persons. So is your guardian angel a person. This is a battle for your soul. Now, God, God wants to give. There's no question about that. And I want to receive. I'm made to receive this grace. Because remember, before the fall, we had God walking and talking inside of us. You know, it says in, in Scripture that Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the Garden of Paradise. Well, uh, God didn't have any legs, so where was God? He was inside of him. Who was walking and talking? Adam and Eve were walking and talking. And so we realize that the sin of Adam and Eve was literally throwing God outside of themselves. They didn't want this intimacy anymore. They wanted to be like God themselves. And so they threw God out, and there left an emptiness inside of us, an emptiness that nothing can fill. I don't care what you find, what you do, how many honors you receive, the goals you accomplish in your life, the power you have, the money you have, doesn't matter anything. None of that will ever completely fulfill us. It can't. Because we're simply trying to fill that emptiness that only God can fill. Once Adam and Eve threw God out, there left that emptiness, and we ex everyone experiences it. Look at your kids. When your kids, at Christmas time, they beg and beg, oh, I want a bike, oh, I want a bike. I never ask for anything again. Yeah, really, you know how long that lasts. The first two weeks after they receive the bicycle, they're cleaning the stinking thing with your toothbrush. After two weeks, you can't tell it from the mud puddle it's in. Now many times you say, get that stinking bike out of the driveway. I'm going to run it over. They don't care anymore. What they thought would fulfill them doesn't. How many times you buy a house? You think this is it. Then you wait for a bigger house. You buy a computer. You want a better computer. You get a phone. You want to get the next phone. Nothing, nothing and no one can fulfill us and satisfy that emptiness. That's why God is born in the city of Bethlehem, which literally means house of bread. He's laid in a manger, which means comes from the word manjari, from manja, to eat. At the height of his career, he said one thing, and hundreds of people walked away. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're dead. And the last supper, take and eat. This is my body. This is my blood. He did this to fulfill what we lost in Adam and Eve, to finally have the indwelling of the Trinity once again inside of us. And this is important. That's why we want to receive. But the problem with this wanting to receive is that sin gets in the way. Pride, covetous, lust, greed, envy, gluttony, anger, sloth, all of the evils of the world will get in the way. And that prevents God from giving. And all of this we get from Adam. All of this sinfulness and sin we get from Adam. So this is in the way of God's giving. 
I took what I got from Adam, but I've added to it. That's the problem. And I've made it much worse. I tell God I reject them, but I know I've got them. I know I have all these things inside of me. Some of them have got a little bit more from Adam than others. Crooks, people who commit sex crimes and so forth. Why not you? Why not me? He's protected you from these things or has pulled you out of them. So in these meditations, one contemplates the sin and what it is. Remember, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a metaphor. Now, this, I talked to you before, is the vision of St. John Paul. The fatherhood love of God give rise to life. This, he, he brings life into the world, creates the universe, the whole universe, creates Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve must return a filial love to God. They must return a filial love to God, but they don't. Rather than that, they reject God and his love and that filial return of love because they want to be the me, myself, and I, which really replaces the Trinity, the egotistical Trinity, me, myself, and I. And they threw God out, and they're left in emptiness. So God sends his only begotten son into the world to return the love. He has to take up Adam and Eve's Nature, human nature. He takes it up upon himself, and he returns finally the love because without this, God's love is utterly frustrated. And so that is the mystery of salvation, according to St. John Paul. What is the response to fatherhood love? The response to a son or daughter, filial love. Adam and Eve broke that initial covenant and refused filial love, replacing it with self-love. Only the Son of God gives filial love to the Father, and that is redemption by the obedience of the cross. He became man to give God the filial love that Adam and Eve denied. Now, There is one thing that I can scientifically prove that the Bible says scientifically, that there's something wrong. Something's wrong. Something's amiss. Something's wrong with man. We were never meant to die. We know that. When we look at all the animals in the world, not one of them have any anxiety over dying. It's a very natural thing. When I was in Brazil, I saw they have these bugs that are so big you need to have a funeral and bury them afterward. And I remember this one bug was lumbering across the uh, courtyard. And I was just interested because it just looked so odd, beautiful thing. I don't even know what it is to the, what was to this day. And what it did was it stopped and it reached itself as on its, like if it had toes, I guess, it had a little whatever they are, pincers. And it looked straight up at the sun. And then like this and touched its head to the cement and died. The most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And you know, you realize that it was a natural thing for that, that bug or animal, I still can't figure it out, to die. But you see, it's not natural for us because we were never meant to die. And so it's a turmoil, it's a rendering. The soul was never meant to be ripped from the body. So God had to come and show us, give us strength so that we would be able to experience death and realize it opens to us the gates of heaven. The angels sin. As I said, St. Thomas sees as revealing to the angels this great mystery of redemption, and they refused it. They saw Bethlehem. That was revealed what, exactly what would happen and how mankind would be fl flowing into hell. And they rejected this and fell from heaven. The dragon fell and swept a third of the stars of heaven. 
St. Paul feels that we are going to take the place of the fallen angels. Can you imagine how many? Think of the millions and millions and millions of people throughout time, billions perhaps. All the devil has is deception. He lost all of his power on Christ. He wrecked himself on Christ. Wrecked himself completely. He killed Christ and has broken ever since. He won then, but lost all. He lost all his power over me. All he has is fear and hate. If he can get you afraid, you're like a deer in the headlights. If he can fill you with fear, you become as dumb as a brick. People who are afraid don't learn anything. People, they, they become stone. When you have hate, you close yourself off to ever learning anything. That's why some of these religious sects, when they turn people against the church, they fill them with fear about the church first, and then they turn that into hate. So they will never come back because they'll never open up to learning. I've never loved, saw, seen anyone leave the Catholic church because they were smart. But I have seen many come to the Catholic church because they were seeking the truth. We must watch our consciousness, not sins. What has gone through my mind this day? Where are my thoughts come from? God, or have I followed my own thoughts that aren't of God? Now here we have, this is an example right here. This is God and myself. This is the mystery of iniquity. That's what we're involved with, the mystery of iniquity. And there are worldly thoughts, most certainly, that all of us have, and the devil can put as many worldly thoughts as he can, and we can put them in ourselves too. But then there are spiritual thoughts, good thoughts. Now, God says, I'm going to communicate to you during prayer. So he gives you an idea, but only where they fit. So, if all you have going on in your head all day are worldly ideas, God ideas, God's ideas won't fit. If I am recollected, he can put me in touch with ideas that I can, that I can communicate. I want to think about what God wants me to think about. If I think good thoughts, he will slip one of his ideas into my thoughts over here. One of his ideas. And I only see this when I make my exam. You know, can't even tell it's there. When you're going through everything, it's just part of everything. It's a part of the flow. And all of a sudden, when you're making your exam and of, your, of your hour of meditation or your day, you go, wow, where did that come from? That was, a, that was God gave me a thought. The second thing God does is he makes the thought that we already have clearer and the impulse stronger. And this is of a thought I already have. And that's called an understanding. That would be like this. We've got the thought already, a good thought that we've put there, but God gives an understanding. He illuminates that thought. That is called an understanding. The first one is called a light. He illuminates the mind and gives us a thought. The other one is an understanding of a thought that's already there. We want God to come through to inspire us purify us. I plead with God. I give God an argument. Lord God, our most loving Father, give me this and give him a good reason why he should give it. Don't just say give me. You're the one who has to put it there. You know, Lord, it would be a help if you could, you know. How do I know if these things are from God? When I look back at a thing that struck me, and I see it's characterized by certain things, and these are the things, this is part of the discernment of spirits now. First, tranquility or peace of soul. Peace of soul is the first thing that you know that this is from God. The second thing is tranquility of mind. The third, quiet of heart. And the fourth, Encouraging and uplifting. Then, 
that is from God, for the devil cannot do that. We've talked about the mystery of iniquity, Satan and the demons, real persons acting independently who hate me and all human beings. No one serves Satan willingly. They are all slaves. Milton, atheist, clearly diabolical. ISIS, clearly diabolical. Why are they so smart? Why do they get away with so much? Because they have a diabolical intellect behind them. Satan and the demons try to influence my thoughts to gluttony, lust, revenge, avarice, sloth. The devil can use a whole kind of bunch of bad thoughts, not just lust. Sometimes he can get one of his bad thoughts in my good ones. That would be like this one here. See that? And it looks good. Kind of looks like the good thoughts. The other ones that I have. He poses an angel of light. How do we discern this? No matter how good a thing looks, they will always be, number one, disturbing. Two, disconcerting. In other words, ill at ease. Third, discomforting. Any thought that discourages you from doing good that you're doing? The thought will be deflating, depressing. All these words begin with D, deception, devil. So you notice the difference. If it is from the good spirit, we have, number one, peace of soul. Tranquility of mind. Quiet of heart. Encouraging. Uplifting. Never act on any individual thought or line of thinking, ever. Get a thought? I remember this one guy, he went to see Brother, Son, Sister, Moon when it came out. shows how old I am. And he went home and he had all this equipment. He wasn't even Catholic, I don't think. I think he was born and baptized Catholic, but never practiced any kind of faith. And he went home after seeing Brother, Son, Sister, Moon about St. Francis, and he gave away about Forty, thirty to forty thousand dollars worth of recording equipment because that's what he was into, and he gave it away to people walking down the street. And I kept saying, "Stop this! Don't do this! Are you crazy? You're going to regret this." Oh, he regretted it all right, and he had to rebuy everything about a week later. Never follow any individual thought or line of thinking. Truly, we never recover from a retreat, a good Ignatian retreat. The devil will tell you that you're going to be the same. It happens after every retreat. Ah, yeah. Don't make a resolution. Make a policy. Never make a resolution as long as you live, because if you break a resolution, it's over and done with. It's dead in the water. If you make a resolution, you can adapt it. You can modify it. You get sick, you praise a sick person. Do it as a sick person. You have company over, you have own children. You can always adapt a policy, but you cannot adapt a resolution. What about a person? What must a person do to commit a sin and go to hell? God, as I said, gives grace upon grace. Now, if you ever get a poem, hold of the poem, Hound of Heaven, it's one of the, outside of sacred scripture, it is the most studied work ever written in English in the history of the language. The Hound of Heaven. It's phenomenal. It's one of the best poems ever written. Very good. Now, I don't, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't want to contemplate scary stuff. Well, you'd better. We've got to. doesn't mean we should try to get scared so we don't go to hell because that's no reason to go to heaven. The wrathful God, the vengeful God is not the God we believe in. 
And that wasn't the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are identical. It's just that the people of the Old Testament were hard-hearted. They were pig-headed. And so they projected into God their stubbornness, their vengeance, their anger, their self-righteousness. Always qualify the word father with my loving and affectionate father. In fact, when I was in a ecumenical group, I remember I was, it was all ecumenical. I was the token priest. I was in uh, Missouri. And I was the first Catholic priest ever to be invited. And there was an imam there. And I was listening to them, and they were so happy to have this Muslim cleric there that they weren't listening to him. And I kept hearing him speak, and I, I, I finally got so uncomfortable. I says, you know something? i got to tell you something. I, I, in order for me to stay here, I, I, we have to establish one basic fundamental principle. And they said, what? I said, we have to all agree, every one of us, that God is a loving and affectionate father. At that moment, the imam stood up, and he banged the table as hard as he could. And as he said, you are lucky we are not yet under Sharia law in this country. Because if we were, before I slit your throat, I would rip the tongue from your mouth for such blasphemy. I was stunned. And I looked at the ministers, and they all just looked at me. And I said, do you know what the opposite of a loving and affectionate father God is? Satan. Well, they ushered me out the door, and while they were closing the door, Father, we will never invite you back again. I said, thank you. <laughs> I was so glad. Listen, anybody ever hate you, consider yourself blessed. Talk good about me, talk bad about me, but talk about me. Who cares if they like you or not? As long as you're doing right, the right, as long as you're doing good, doesn't matter whether people like you or say good things about you. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. So now, God gives grace upon grace, more warning upon warning, so one must truly reject God. My loving and affectionate Father, the only one who goes to hell is the one who really wants to go there. I'm repeating it. Every person in hell is a volunteer. How Jesus fought with Judas. How he yearned for Judas. You know, Judas performed miracles. He did wonderful things. And how Jesus just fought for his soul. Then you have people like Karl Marx, who was quoted in saying, I want to take all to hell with me. He was someone who had gotten to this point. There was no turning back for him. How many people die in this state? I remember there was a man in a hospital where I was working. And he had all of his wealth, he was dying, and had all of his wealth turned into cash. I didn't know that they made bills that big. And he had his body covered with them, cash. And he swore against the church. And he said, I'm taking all of this with me. And so he brought in a lawyer. I was there. I wasn't in the room. He wouldn't let me come near him. And uh, they had him, the, he made the lawyer sign a statement that all of his money would be buried with him. Much to the anger of, you know, his family was, was Catholic. And they said, why? Why waste the money? Because I want to be buried with every dime. So they signed the agreement. And he died. And they came up to me and they said, Father, isn't it sinful to just take all of this money and bury it in the ground? What, what should we do? And I looked at the man who was dead. And I looked at all the money laying all over him. And I said, well, write him a check. <laughs> they did.
Now, if he commits that one sin, he'll be in hell for all eternity. Just that one sin. He won't take any more grace because he would be deeper in hell. It is God's mercy that stops giving him the grace. I am contemplating in this thought the one where Jesus said it would have been better if he'd never been born. Jesus always speaks in eternity. Remember that as you're going through these days. The father of those you have given me, I haven't lost one of them except the son of perdition. So that the scriptures will be fulfilled. Judas was so hard in sin that he could let Jesus wash his feet and look directly into his eyes and so hard that he even says, is it I, Lord? What is he in hell for? Suicide? Betrayal? He repented of his betrayal. Peter was sorry because of Christ. Judas was sorry because of himself. You know, it's interesting. Do you know why the church always has always given communion on the tongue? Because of Judas. You know why? Because at the Last Supper, there was a tradition in the times of Jesus where one person, only one person, was honored by the host of the Passover, he would take the blessed bread and dip it into the wine, and he would go over and he would feed it to the one person to show the most extraordinary kind of love to that person. And he bore that title of having received that blessed bread for that entire year. And he does this for Judas. Now in doing this, he not only was reaching out into the depths of Judas's heart, but he was also covering him, hiding him. Because remember, Peter says, somebody's going to betray him. What's this? John, find out who it is. Now, John and Jesus knew that if Peter found out, he would have torn Judas apart with his teeth. So he gives this sign. And at the same time, he's showing this great love. No one, having received that gift, would have ever betrayed anybody. Not after receiving that honor, that, sh that sign of love. That's the reason why the church has always given communion on the tongue. For we, has, we have all been Judas. And Jesus is showing us that special love. In our parish, where I live, I usually try to distribute all the Eucharist myself. As an altar Christus, the faithful have a right to receive the body of Jesus from Jesus himself. And so it is Christ who gives that communion. That's why we have distributed communion on the tongue. Have I, you, have you not been specially protected God knows your past, present, and future, and also all the possibilities. He knows the circumstances in which I might go to hell. It's love that doesn't let you go deeper than need. What is it about me? Pride, sensuality, love of material things. I look at one in hell for all eternity. As Lazarus and Abraham and the other, a sense of loss. Although I think that, you know, the story of Lazarus, I think Jesus is speaking of purgatory. Because no one in hell could have compassion on someone else. And because this rich man sought compassion for his brothers, I believe that it seems to me that Jesus is speaking of purgatory. Believe me, I don't want to settle for purgatory. 
Dear God, you've got to pull me out. Pull me back. And you are. Every time one of us has fallen, every time you have fallen, God has given you the grace to come back to him. The difference between a saint and a sinner is one confession. God is always giving efficient grace. He's given each one of you a special grace. You are destined for Almighty God. You are made for God. And at times you must be won back by God. Now, this here is kind of like kind of what St. John of the Cross is kind of like what he does. We see myself, the self, Jesus comes to be one with us. Okay? He comes and he he, he travels with us. He's on the pilgrimage with us as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are. And they're constantly trying to raise us up to God. But myself, I have pride of life, concupiscence of the flesh, concupiscence of the eyes, and so forth. And it's constantly pulling me down. It's like a wind draft that's dragging me down. And Christ is always trying to lift me up through that mess. Jesus is the one who pulls me up. Pride of life, you, me, I'm the chief guy. Concupiscence of the eyes pulls me towards nice things of this world. Concupiscence of the flesh, not just sex, but all the comforts of life. Nice clothing, nice chairs, sleep. You'll never find in the Sister Missionaries of Charity an upholstered chair. You'll never find it. You don't find an answering machine. You don't find a television. You don't find a radio. You find nothing but a bunch of buckets. God put his dying son at the gates of hell, and each person must pass him and reject him. Oh, most certainly there isn't anyone in hell who doesn't know any better. As I say, they are all volunteers. To contemplate God is a marvelous thing. We must visualize, visualize ourselves imprisoned in this body like animals and beasts, but with a soul that doesn't belong here. I ask for that love that God will reveal to me one that revelation gives me. I seek to know Lucifer, that is the Lucifer, the leader of all evil people. I am a chosen person. You are chosen before God, who has been so good to you, out of millions of souls, millions in this country, millions in the church, Catholics. You're a chosen soul. And of all these, how many are truly devoted to the Holy See? How many are truly obedient? How many true religious are there left? Now we know, now we look at this here. Lucifer is deformed. He's evil. No question about that. Now, me, I enter in there. We've got that Lucifer, deformed evil. Adam, deceived, loss. Ruin for so many, but not me. Why? I'm a sinner whose many have been destroyed and gone to hell. I'm a sinner, but not for me. Why? Mercy in the presence of misery. That's what merciful is. Mercy is therefore love, and I want love. I just want to be with God, imploring love, loving God with an empty heart. I want to realize your tremendous love and predilection for me because I see what sin did to the devil. It utterly deformed from the most beautiful to the most malignant. I have a different reality. I'm a sinner. 
I must really be honest to God, admit I'm a sinner. And as such, Jesus Christ died for me. And I don't realize the impact until I realize that I deserve hell. And without Jesus, I would be there. Lucifer, deformed evil, pure evil. So many ruined, not for me. Why? I want honest to God. I want to love you various ways. I confess it to you. I'm a sinner. I'm still alive. You have helped me. A desiring love. Dear Lord, I desire with all my heart to love you with a great desire, a thorough conversion, contrition, a confessing love. I'm a sinner if I can sin. I'm a violinist if I can play the violin. Just because I'm not sinning. Did I tell you about the little old lady? No. Yeah, I was giving a talk in, in Missouri, and... I was telling people, you know, you got to go to confession often. All of us are sinners. All of us have sinfulness. I says, you have to go to confession often. And the older you get, the more often you have to go. And I remember this little lady, she was sitting around here. And she raised her hand. And she says, Father, she said, I, I, I'm 97 years old. And go to confession, I... What could I possibly confess? I, I don't sin. And I looked at her and I said, really? I said, well, you can just confess you lied to a priest. <laughs> Everybody sins. There's not one single one of us that doesn't sin. I don't care how old you are. In fact, in the seminary, I asked my spiritual director, Father Bro, and I said, Father, when are these temptations going to end? I thought he was going to say, well, once you're ordained, uh, then you're going to really be flying high. He didn't. He said, when are they going to end, Father? And he said, figure out how long you're going to live and then add a week. <laughs> well, he was right. If I'm a sinner, I can sin. There's ruin for so many, but not for me. Why? Because God loves me. So I have a confessing love. Adam, Adam and Eve, they were deceived. They were suckers. I see all the effects of that throughout the entire world. Wars, communism, ISIS. But not for you, not for me. Personally, I've suffered very little from these sins, even my own sin. All of us have. So I'm abashed. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm stupefied. I don't know how you say abashed in other ways. And I'm getting a heck of a lot of stuff that I don't deserve. Abashed means I'm almost ashamed to keep receiving one thing after another after another. All that I have been spared of, all that came from that one sin, concupiscence, the prisons are full. Why am I not in prison? I've been protected from these sins. What if I wouldn't have gotten away with the wrong that I have done? Would I have been put in jail? Learn to be a crook. But merciful love. Ruined for so many, but not for me. Deceived? Again, not me. Adam, yes, but not me. I'm preserved from this deception, so I'm filled with an awe, an awe-filled love of the Almighty. And I see so many tragedies, marriages, and all these other things that are taking place. How many priests have defected walked away from the church, gone to religions, false religions, or left the 
faith completely. My most loving and affectionate Father, my perfect friend, Jesus, he has forgiven me in my sleep. His whole life was that my sins may be forgiven. His whole life. That's why for the priest, there are two things that are the most important things in the life of the priest. First, to confect the Eucharist. There's no greater thing that a priest can do. The primordial sacrament, the sacrifice of Calvary, but second only to that is to forgive sin. Second only to that. As far as I'm concerned, let the deacons marry people and baptize them. Although it's nice and you, know, you can do that, but I'm not, you know. I would, if, if it comes up between hearing a confession or a life confession or celebrating Mass, I'll give all that other stuff to the deacon except anointing. No deacon can anoint, you know. You do know that, right? Okay. Because I find deacons doing that all the time. It drives me nuts. Dear Lord, I believe in your love, a believing love. I'm a sinner. Sinners. The man who is not only deceived and deformed, but utterly destroyed, who goes to hell. I assent to these truths, therefore I have a assenting love. I assent to this. You see, a fall is evil only if it moves you to despair. But if a fall should move you to humility, trust, and love, if it moves in that direction, it is the healthiest thing in the world. If you fall, you should move to humility, trust, and love. The fall, humility, trust, and love. Regardless of the fall, Jesus Christ died for it. Even to Judas, my friend, what are you doing to me? I have fearful love, not of God, but of myself. I'm afraid of myself. We have to have fear of God, but it is not the fear that you think. It is the fear to offend someone you love, like a child afraid to offend their parents without realizing it. I have fearful love. I seek God's meaning. You know, we do nothing in prayer. We do nothing. Because you need a prevenient grace to pray. I've told you this before. You need a concomitant grace to keep going along with it. And you need a consequent grace to finish it. Every single aspect of every prayer you have ever prayed is God's gift to you. I want your meaning, O oh Lord. In the morning, O oh God, come to my assistance. Like when trying to move a rock. Little kid trying to move a rock. Dad comes along, picks it up, moves it. We need God to do it for us. God helps us. No, he does it all. My soul is a prisoner living among brute beasts. There's no question about that. My sins are forgiven. We need to be forgiven for our sinfulness, not just our sins. There are two kinds of confession. There is the confession of restoration, and there is the confession of devotion. The restoration, one, is returned to the grace they had prior to the sin. In other when you go, when you restoration, you are restored to grace. The confession of devotion, you multiply the grace and part of the temporal punishment due to sin is remitted. That's the reason why Pope John Paul went to confession three, four times a week. My mother Teresa went at least three times a week. Every time I saw her, there was a priest around, she would go to confession. People don't go to confession because they're, they're so horrible. I mean, most people, they wait. They never wait to go to confession. God is love, and he wants to give me every single one of his blessings. You see, I want to receive this. Every one of his blessings I want. But sin gets in the way. Pride prevents those choice blessings, covetousness, lust, Love of things, luxurious stuff, gluttony, inordinate love of taste, envy, a comparison with other people. You know, to compare yourself with other people, did I tell you about the Chaldean weddings? No, I didn't. 
you know, we do this a lot. We, we put ourselves up against other people, and of course we're going to look better. I was at a Chaldean wedding, and if you ever go to want to crash a wedding, go to a Chaldean wedding. They usually spend about forty to $50,000 just for the party. It's phenomenal. You feel like you just walked into the vestibule of heaven. And I went there once because they wanted me to bless the food, and I heard all the confessions of the best the men, the, the, and usually they have about 15 guys standing up for the wedding. So they asked me, would you please bless the food? And I said, okay. And that's when the first time I ever saw this magnificent spread that they do. And they said, Father, we would like a picture of you with all of the groomsmen. And I said, you want a picture of me with the groomsmen? He said, yes. I said, okay, just wait for a minute. So I went, and I tracked down two of the fattest groomsmen I could find. I mean, these guys were gigantuan. And I looked at one, and I said, now listen, we're going to be taking a picture. And I want you, big guy, to stand over on my left. And you stand on my right. I look like that. Best picture I've ever taken. But we can do that a lot. We compare ourselves with other people, and then we don't look so bad. That's the wrong way to go about it. We must put ourselves before Christ, not comparing ourselves with other people. Do I have an anger, an inordinate sense of justice? That's sinful. Sloth, a lack of determination to do what I should be doing. If any of these things go into action, it is sin. If they don't, it's sinfulness. All of us have these things. So I can confess my sinfulness. If I go to confession, I can say, Lord, uh, Father, I have the sinfulness of pride, sloth, Greed. I get angry sometimes. I have that sinfulness within me. And then to receive the sacrament, you place before them a sin. All your past sins are matter for confession. So you can say, Father, I am especially sorry for all the sins I've committed against thee, and then pick a commandment. And the priest now can grant you the absolution, and you multiply in grace, and some of that temporal punishment due to sin is forgiven. Now, temporal punishment due to sin. Every time we sin, we cause a disharmony in creation. And that has to be repaired. If it isn't, then society, mankind, becomes more broken. And so we have to repair it. Now, there's the best way to repair it is to fall madly in love with Christ because, remember, he's there when you were sinning. He can undo the damage, which sometimes it's by... Dedicating your life, volunteering, giving alms, all these different ways of diminishing the temporal punishment due to sin. So if I go, if these sinfulnesses go into action, it's actual sin. That's why it's actual sin. They go into act. If they don't, it's sinfulness. Having these means that I am a sinner, even though they don't become actual sin, it is sinfulness. And I always need to be forgiven for my sinfulness. I always have, therefore, material for confession. I can always find sinfulness within myself. It's not in a conscious, you know, it's not like we're consciously involved in this sinfulness, but it's part of us. We realize this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most loving and affectionate Father, help us to understand who and what we are before thee. Grant us each the grace to see ourselves as we really are. Through the intercession of the most blessed Virgin Mary, grant us a heart that can truly love. And when you say love others as you love yourself, let us love the true self image and likeness of Christ within us. We ask this. The intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of divine grace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.